past, present, and future. And so and Prabhupada was a person who was directly in contact with Krishna. So on that level of spiritual understanding, he could actually speak about the future and how we would have to prepare ourselves as a society and as an individuals within the society to be able to continue to uh, practice Krishna consciousness and at the same time be a, a uh, you know, a plan maker for the rest of the world. So what I'm trying to say is that what Prabhupada said about the future part of his movement will actually come to pass in terms of how the society will actually uh, force us into that direction. Either that, either we'll amalgamate into society and become a victim, we'll fall away from Krishna consciousness, or we'll actually go with Srila Prabhupada's plan one way or the other. So, uh, yeah, so that fourth part, I just wanted to emphasize because it's, um, it's the future of our movement. I feel strong about that. There may be people who disagree with me. It doesn't mean we don't continue on with the programs we do have. But unless we emphasize that, we really don't have much of a future in our movement. in terms of the social development of our society. And that's that's foundational for devotees to get situated nicely in order they, so they can practice Krishna consciousness. And we're talking mostly about those who are in, in family life. The, the uh, sannyasis and brahmacharis are more mobile, they're more flexible. They can go with the times, but the grihasas need to be established in a, uh, a situation where they can take care of all their personal needs and at the same time grow in Krishna consciousness. And as is, as the statistics show, 85 to 90 percent of our members are in family life. Like that. It's a very small percentage that are not. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the majority of our devotees. Thank you. I just wanted to add to your evaluation. Thank you. <laughs> Trying to be a parent and failing. <laughs> so uh, day two, you kind of touched on those uh, last aspects of diving by uh, and then farm communities. We had an opportunity to uh, witness a uh, video scam of farms in Croatia or Slovenia. So we can look at some of that application. Uh, and then uh, Bhutta Bhavana got into uh, first principle of systematic uh, propagation of spiritual knowledge. And one of the things that uh, kind of stood out uh, was some of the principles that we're being asked to do sim simply or uh, four regular principles, but one that came to mind was diet. Um, by maintaining uh, a Krishna conscious diet, we can actually access uh, the, our goals to, to be connected with Krishna in a very intimate way. He also meant it by chanting and that chanting uh, being done during the Brahma Mahirti uh, and also glorification of great souls. And he was speaking of uh, Srila Prabhupada very nicely about how the glorification actually impacts you. Um, it's a purification process along with the chanting, but actually it, that glorification is a measure of affection. And through that affection, um, Krishna becomes very uh, enamored by that as well. So when the devotee is, the pure devotee is being glorified at the guru, then in actuality, uh, Krishna is being glorified as well. And Krishna likes to do the same thing. He also likes to glorify his devotee. So um, this brought up the idea of what Sankirtan is, that we're actually sitting in a place and we're doing glorification of Krishna, 
but the devotees who are actually singing about Krishna's holy, na holy names are also being glorified in that same fashion. Um, I don't know, Bhuta Bhavana, if, if I missed anything, if there's anything else that you wanted to uh, touch on, to uh, emphasize, please uh, jump in. And if not, I'll just go on. Oh, I think it's like, oh, okay. So um, then we jumped into uh, today as Buddha Bhavana uh, so nicely explained uh, how to propagate Krishna consciousness in this particular time and some of the things that were necessary to do that. Again, getting back to reading the uh, Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, he mentioned uh, Nitya Bhagavata Sevayam Bhagavati Uttama Shloki Bhakti Bhagavati Naishtiki. Translation by regular attendance and classes in the Bhagavatam by rendering of service to the pure devotee. All that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed in loving service unto the person out of the Godhead who is praised with transcendental song as establishes a, a rebel fact. So we, we touched on that point before. So Prabhupada, he, he also ended with saying, Prabhupada said, you are restless because you don't read. And regular study destroys the lower modes of nat nature. So getting into that psychology, and I just wanted to add, as I was listening uh, to Bhutta Bhavana explain this, uh, I could actually hear uh, Bhakti Tirta Swami emerge uh, because his view was psychology, <laughs> spiritual psychology. So um, that's very nice to hear the disciples speak because they actually, it's running from Srila Prabhupada or actually the entire Parampara. But these specific points that are very poignant and during this particular age that we are in, that's degrading every day, this whole idea of insulating or inoculating ourselves with the holy name by, by regular attendance and not being, as he mentioned, uh, Bhutta Bhavana mentioned before, being spotty or irregular in that practice, um, uh, that's really helpful. Um, he also mentioned in the third principle, if I can get my mouse to work, it seems like it's died on me. Um, uh, how one can, uh, he talk, talked about to, to bring the members to the society uh, together with each other and nearer to Krishna, the prime entity, thus developing the idea within the uh, membership, uh, the ideas of human for humanity at large. So I'm still waiting for my mouse to move, I'm trying to make this point, and this is not working. Um, one thing that stood out was that <clears throat> he talked about how devotees have this expectation or this impur impersonalism when maybe a devotee is not acting or behaving properly, then there's a tendency to just group um, Ishkan or devotees in that same light, not understanding that to consider all devotees to be the same is actually offensive and impersonalist, impersonalist uh, point of view. So it's important to understand that there's degradations of devotees uh, first, second class devotees or devotees you can see that are maybe have mastered some things. Maybe they're very good uh, preachers. They give good class, but they're terrible at um, uh, devotee relations. Um, so we're all working on some specific things that are going to improve. And, and also uh, selecting the, um, the type of association, understanding that if I want to improve, then at least appreciate a quality of a devotee and try to associate with that quality versus uh, this quality is not working with me so well. So let me try to um, not, not associate with it or um, avoid specific associations that actually lower your grade. 
Okay, my mouse is working now, so I can. Uh, you don't have to be close to everyone. That was the point he was making, but respect the voties. Choose your association wisely. To expect all the voties to behave well. Again, he mentioned that was impersonalism, and everyone is not the same. But not revealing your mind to a friend. This is another point he was making about, uh, which is in uh, Bhakti Shastra and Nectar of instru Instructions about um, revealing your mind to devotees and the expectation that the devotee won't destroy you. In other words, you're getting some positive feedback. And if you have some personal issue, rather talk about how that issue impacts you feeling, feelingly, as opposed to making some type of criticism. Um, to teach, another principle, to teach and encourage the Sankirtan movement, congregational chant, uh, chanting, uh, as revealed by the teachings of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. We are giving the opportunity to experience Krishna in Vrindavan. This is like the highest point that he was, he was trying to make and to do that in a very intimate way. We are also giving the opportunity to benefit from congregational chanting. Without Prabhupada, we wouldn't have veganism, yoga, all these principles and concepts dealing with uh, the new age, all that that we're experiencing now is directly related to Shiva Prabhupada. And I concur with that wholeheartedly. Uh, without the sacrifice, it's almost impossible to meet the need or the goals for Krishna consciousness. So that sacrifice, again, getting back to following principles, uh, reading regularly, Krishna Kata, so forth and so on. I, I know I need to wrap this up, so let me move on to um, uh, principle number five. To bring members closer together for the purpose of teaching uh, a simpler, more natural way of life. And again, that's kind of reiterating. Why are we having institutions living in a natural way? Maybe that's an agrarian type of lifestyle. Or even if you're, um, Maharaj was talking about, even if you're living in a city, how you can simplify things. Um, and that may be the services that you're doing, but trying not to complicate things in your life. And then understanding how you can deal with in family relations. Uh, if that means seeking help, or again, how you're trying to raise, there was a question about raising your child. They're not obeying, they're not obedient. And then one of the last points that Buddha Bhavana was talking about uh, not telling your children when they're very young, you know, no, if they want to play with this, you kind of substitute so you can engage them so they can be confident when they become older. And number six or seven, uh, yeah, that's seven, uh, with a view towards achieving the aforementioned purposes uh, to publish and distribute uh, periodicals, magazines, books, so uh, Buddha Bhavana was, was emphasizing that when we're writing something, we're actually benefiting. And as we are communicating with other people, they're benefiting as well. This is maybe in a class or something like that. And the importance, as Maharaj talked about, of asking questions. It's an intimate relationship, so learning can actually increase. And this can actually deepen the realization and also create a, a higher level of purification. So I'll end it there. Um, probably missed a few things, but I wanted to kind of wrap it up because just as you speak into this, other ideas come or other things that were said, uh, and they can it can kind of expand, kind of like Christian. It's always expanding. So <laughs> thank you for the service. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for expanding the expansions. <laughs> yes, thank you, Chandra Prabhu. Gurmesh, sorry, are you going to say something?
I'm just going to be ready for questions. I don't really have anything I can add that was, I didn't really eliminate in my original presentations. I think everything now can be, anything else additional can be brought out in the form of questions and answers. Unless Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu would like to uh, expand on something that he feels he should expand on. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chandra Prabhu, so much for that summary. It's really helpful to bring it all together for us. Thank you. Uh, so as mentioned, the leftover question that we didn't get. Sorry. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yes, Mataji. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, your broadcast, your your broadcast, your broadcast is a little broken up, but it's okay. Okay. Sorry. So, as mentioned, we'll begin with uh, going over the audio the is good, but the video is a the audio is okay, but not the video. Okay. Um. So as mentioned, we'll start with questions that we didn't get to over the course of the weekend. If you have any additional questions, please do send them to Anjali Mataji over the chat. She will send them to me, or you're also welcome to raise your hand and ask the question as well. Let's jump right in. Um, we'll start with the first question from Janaki Nakrabhu. This is for you, Gurmaraj. He says, Hare Krishna Gurmaraj. Once we had a devotee give a class in the ashram. I forgot his name, but he wrote the book, Spiritual Economics. He was explaining that we will not see the full-fledged effect of Varnashram system in our society for at least another 100 years or so. He was saying that the delay is due to lack of infrastructure and lack of training and teachers. What is your view on that? Will it take that long for it to be properly instituted? Daneshwar is a devotee and I've read part of his books He's got a lot of interesting and very relevant points to make. Um, in relationship to the training part, I think he is right. And this is where Shiva Ram Maharaj has put his emphasis on in, because uh, he's also working in that area to develop this Daivi Ashram. And he said it requires training. So in order for it to actually expand into a full, fledged program within our society, it may take many, many decades, but there is a way to do it on an on individual basis, on a local basis, where each yatra, uh, temple, can develop within their own the system. Everyone can have a farm community, every, every organization or every yatra or every temple Every GBC involved with that particular area can be a, a vanguard in order to bring about that program within their own area. So Dhaneshwar is just speaking for the whole society, but we should also think in terms of how it can be done on a local level. Radhana Swami has been quite successful in establishing Govardhan Echo Village, which is a real basis for that whole program. Of course, they're need, they've filled in a lot of the areas that is needed, but there's still more work to be done. So there's an example of two leaders who have emphasized this particular program in their areas and they're working on it. The problem is it's not being emphasized in, across the board around the world. So until it's given focus, it won't develop. <laughs> Thank you. But then again, 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 as the society falls apart, we'll be scrambling in order to find, you know, where we can fit in. And that may be too late. You can't really build something in a default mode when you're trying to save yourself at the same time. That's why things have to be organized and planned ahead of time. And that was Prabhupada's vision. He laid the foundation for the whole thing. 
So Dhaneshwar has has a good point, but he's talking about it in a broader sense. But it can be done individually. Yatras areas can work on these Van Ashram programs. Thank you, Maraj. Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu, would you like to say something on that question as well? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, um, very good. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I really appreciate the, I, I, I've got that book, Spiritual Economics by Dan Ishra. And um, yeah, it's a brilliant book. I, I read it quite a while ago. So I'll, I, I have not really anything to add because I think he's, he's done a lot more calculation and Morris has a lot more realization than I do on this. But yeah, so it's, um, <laughs> it's, a, very, it's a very great point because yeah, unfortunately, the more the more that we the more that we live in the natural lifestyle, the more we create unnecessary challenges for ourselves. It's just mm. the reality of the situation. So I have nothing else to add. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for you, Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu. Can we, can we have a deep, friendly relationship with devotees that we are directly managing? To that, how can we have a friendly relationship with devotees in a small community that we are directly managing? I mean, I'd love to hear more of this view, but I, I believe it would be possible, but you have to be mature about it. It can often be a... Um, Practically, there can often be uh, a challenge when you're managing someone if, and this is the this is the if, if A, you're not very good at managing and B, there's limitations, you know, so then there, there tends to be more of a, of a concern around getting stuff done. And we do need to get stuff done, but there's also the mood in which it's done. So I think there can be that kind of relationship. We just have to be very mature about it. We have to be very... It seems to be mature, maturity is required, transparency is required. So the ability to really honestly say, look, this is what needs to be done. There are, you know, there's these limitations. That's why I'm asking you to do this. And it's a, and it's a very, very mature two-way exchange. I guess the thing to avoid is people feeling that they're being used or exploited. I think that's the key thing. The key, um, there's, um, there's a quote. There's a quote that I, I shared with some devotees the other day, and it's a quote by Prabhupada, and he's basically make, making the point that people are doing and serving with him. I can, I can find the quote and read it to you if, if you want, but it, he's basically saying that people are serving him and you know, serving Krishna out of love. And he's very, and I share this with some other devotees. This, you know, there's the calendar. So there's a Prabhupada calendar and every day there's a different quote. So this was a calendar entry sent on the 9th of April. And so the quote will be from that day, one of the, in one of the years that Prabhupada was preaching um, and spreading the movement. And he talks about, he says, we should not let this, um, it should not let the movement become an impersonal business exchange. And Prabhupada says, quote unquote, he said, this will kill everything. So I guess it's really about doing things in such a way that there's transparency, there's trust, and if we can do things in the way that people are inspired, then, it, then it's more likely to be engaged in with the proper mood rather than engaged in as I'm being kind of pushed around, I'm being used. Because I've seen this, it, when devotees feel that happens, sometimes people can even come to the point that they feel like they don't want to be part of the movement anymore. And they feel that they've been exploited or, or mistreated and then, they, then it leaves a very bitter taste. And if we think long-term, they can sometimes be the people who become the greatest critics of the movement and, and Krishna consciousness. Because if they've had a, if they came to the movement very open hearted, very trusting, and if that trust is misused, then it can, it can really hurt a person. And with that kind of pain, they may also then express something in a certain way. So I believe it can be done, but it just has to be done very clearly, very openly, very honestly. And it should be done on the basis of a relationship of love and, and concern for the service and the individual as well. Thank you, Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu. Gurmaj, would you like to say something on that as well? 
I have the April 9th quote right here in front of me. I could read it with Bhuta Bhavan. It kind of says, Prabhupada speaking, this is a letter to one devotee called Bhakti Das, April 9th, 1972. I can only suggest, and whenever possible, that can be applied, but I do not force anyone. After all, you are working too hard to please Krishna only out of love for me. So there could be no question of force if love is there. We should never, we should not ever try to force anyone or reduce our society to an impersonal business exchange. That will kill everything. Our only purpose in spiritual life or in pleasing Krishna. So one thing I could just add is that um, a quote that Lord Prabhupada said, and it's more like a sutra, but it kind of sums it all up. Um, Bhauta Bhavana broke it down, showing the dynamics of the success and the dynamics of the failure. But Prabhupada's quote was that the leaders, the managers should be very affectionate to their followers and the followers should be very obedient to the leaders. And that was Prabhupada's. So when affection is coming from the leaders, not only just managing, but in a, in a, in a caring way, because this is Prabhupada said, we, we're setting up a family, a spiritual family. We're all developing, trying to develop our love for Krishna. But if we don't develop our love for our relationships with each other, then we'll never be able to develop our love for Krishna. It's just not, it doesn't work. And, it, it just is like the, the saying in the, in the Christian Bible. Um, what is it? It, it? Whatever you do to the least of my kingdom, you do unto me also. <laughs> Christ is speaking like that. So how we treat each other is our reflection and how we are, uh, is our do as our relationship or how our relationship with Krishna will develop. So again, Prabhupada said, it should be done with affection, with concern in a very personal way. Seeing the situation, uh, we've always put the service before the person. And that's one of the problems in our society. Now we're, we're trying to learn to put this person before the service because when the person is giving everything they need, including, including the encouragement they need to serve, and, and the facilities that they need to carry out their service, then the service gets done nicely. We've always had it backwards. We always put the cart before the horse. You know, get the service done in any way possible, doesn't matter who does it, and, you know, just get it done. And therefore, as Uta Bhavan has said, some of these persons have become the greatest critics of our society <laughs> because they have been mistreated. So yeah, love and, love and trust is the basis principle that, that we, we, we should be operating on that platform. And the more love and trust in there, the less GBC resolutions you're gonna have. <laughs> We're trying to resolute or institute or legislate love and trust in so many rules and regulations. That's just for the lack of love and trust. So we have to put in so many rules and regulations. But when love and trust is there, you'll find things happen more naturally. So that takes a while to develop. It's not just, you can say it and it'll happen, but we have to practice that move. Thank you, Gurmaraj. Um, the next question is from Devananda Prabhu for you, Gurmaraj. He says, Hare Krishna, I have one concern. We have a successful, self-sufficient community with cows, land, and so on. I think that if there is a collapse in the city next door, its residents will come to our community, not for protection, but in order to take our resources. Even if not the people, the state will want to nationalize our resources under the pretext of an emergency. Are there any programs in the successful communities of Shivram Swami and Radhana Swami to effectively protect against such attacks from the people and the state? And can there ever be 100% protection against such attacks in principle? 
Well, I think we should make some communication from the local authorities um, to ensure some kind of stability in our pro process. But it seems like the question is conjectural. In other words, this may happen, but, but, it, but it may not happen. So if it may happen, what can you do to prevent that? <laughs> well, um, we, uh, yeah, Prabhupada also said our movement should be protected by martial spirited devotees who know how to fight. <laughs> He said, "The business of the of the, uh, the the administrators is that they have to manage the temples, and they also know and also have to defend the temples when we get attacked from outside." Okay. So yeah, so that has to be there too. If you have just the Brahmins and the and the Vaishyas, and you don't have the Kshatriyas, then you're going to have problems. <laughs> but you you actually invite problems then. So the managers, the kshatriyas, this is part of the development of the Vanashra, those who have that martial spirited nature. And I know so many devotees who are on the fringe, who are really very martial spirited and are looking for some ways to help the society, but they don't really find any service within our society. So what they're doing is they're teaching martial arts to people well, in general, in order to make a living. But a lot of them you know, would like to be actually more engaged in Krishna conscious activities. But we don't see the need for such persons. And that was something I directly got involved with a few years ago. Although there, I know one leader who is very strong about that, and that's Jai Pataka Maharaj. He really wanted us to develop the Kshatriya principle within our society so we could defend ourselves from outside attacks. It's just likely that will happen. So there has to be a defense mechanism to protect. And that's part of that's part of an ashram. That's part of Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. But Kshatriya means pr protector, not aggressor. <laughs> we're not aggressors, we're just, we have to protect the interests of the deities, the devotees, and the, the community. Thank you very much. Uh, Guta Bhavana Prabhu, would you like to say something on that question as well? No, to be honest, I think that's all. I think Mark just said everything. Okay. So the next topic, uh, sorry, question is from Lavanya Mataji for you, Guta Bhavana Prabhu. She says, I understand the sense of purpose and I get motivated, but I am unable to motivate others around me. Please, can you give some tips? Okay, so you understand the purposes and you're motivated, but you feel that you're unable to motivate others. Okay, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is to go to others and ask them what they're into. What, how, what, how do they want to serve Krishna? And then find some mutual, mutual interest that they have that you can also engage with them on that particular service. So if you start with them, so you and you just, you just have to have conversation. So, what it could be something they're doing already, something that they want to do. So, tapping into their inspiration. I, a mistake I've made in the past is that I'm motivated about something, and I want everyone else to do what I'm into. Well, I found find work a little bit better is to find out what's the inspiration that people have. And I think that Prabhupada was sometimes talking about finding the spark. So people would suggest to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, we think this will be a good service. Prabhupada would just encourage them. And, and because they have that impetus within them, they have that desire to serve and they're encouraged, amazing things would happen. In fact, what happens is if people are inspired, there's even less politics because it changes the way that you feel about what you're doing. And instead of it being something that's imposed from outside, 
it's something that's coming from within you. There's more resilience, more willingness to tolerate, willingness to sacrifice. So that entire spirit of, of um, enthusiasm, which we know from Nectar of Instruction, is one of those things with principles which are favorable for devotional service. That, that enthusiasm is able to express itself in its fullest um, capacity. So I would suggest find out what they are into. And then you can speak to many different people. And when you find someone or a few people and there's some similarity of interest and it aligns with something that you're also inspired to do, then you work together. That's just, there's many ways, but that would be one ideal or one way forward. Nice, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the next question is for both of you, actually, from Sudha Mataji. She says, how can we help ourselves if somebody is draining our energy? What is the best way to rectify our own mentality and improve our discrimination? Raj, if you could please begin. Um, somebody's draining your energy. What is the way? Well, um, it reminds me of the quote by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. He says, when the faults of others are, are disturbing you, he says, look inside yourself and see what is it about yourself that's causing you to become disturbed. So, yeah, maybe that's the first thing we should do. What is it about me that is causing me to become disturbed by this other person's faults? And then maybe you can work from there. Uh, but in, in some extreme cases, unless you have to be in that arena, you better to distance yourself from that energy. If there's some responsibility in that area, then trying to make a difference by expressing yourself accordingly. Uh, and at the same time, not criticizing the other person, because if you start finding fault and you verbalize it, and then you know, all of a sudden you have a bigger problem. You have to remain humble, but introspective and intelligent how to deal with the situation. It's just like <clears throat> one time what happened to me was there was one devotee who was criticizing one very senior devotee. And uh, <clears throat> so I, uh, I approached him. And uh, very carefully, and I knew he was ready to fire on me too. So I was ready for that. So I just presented that, why are you finding fault with this devotee? And I said a few things. And then he went into his, you know, lashing out. And then I just sat there and I listened. And once in a while I said something. But I just let him speak. When he was finally done speaking, after he was all done, you know, and I just stood there like this most of the time, hands folded, he actually changed. And I didn't say much, but I said something to help him to recognize that what he was feeling wasn't right. He apologized for his attitude and said he was going to apologize to that devotee that he was finding fault with. So it was tough for me. I had to sit there and listen to it, but I was expecting it. So I was ready for whatever he was gonna throw at me. And I tried not to let it affect me. And I was listening to him to say at the same time and seeing his disturbed mind and how it was unraveling and complaining about this person. But after everything was done, he actually apologized. <laughs> so this is one example of how sometimes you have to deal with people who are like that. You just have to be, you have to listen and then say the right thing at the right time to diffuse. If that, that that's one technique, the other technique is to somehow or other see if you can change their attitude through sweet words or diverting the subject is something that is less controversial. Okay. Now, when it comes to family members, then uh, I'll divert that to Bhuta Bhavana because <laughs> I think he's more expert in that area. 
<laughs> um, I, I'm not more expert at all. <laughs> That's my disclaimer. Um, one thing I, I was reflecting on in my own life, in different, in various situations and interactions, is that. So again, when we were studying this, when we, as we have been studying Bhagavatam, and this idea that um, the material energy is Krishna's energy, and therefore we're not the controller, but the energy is being controlled by someone who's ultimately our well-wisher. And so the meditation that naturally arises from there is that any situation that we're in, there's some reason why we're in that situation. There's some lesson to learn from that situation. So what I've seen in my own life is that if, I, if I'm able to really honestly look at it and understand what is Krishna trying to teach me, and, and what I found is also, it's good to try to reflect on that myself, pray constantly, Krishna, what do you want me to learn? You know, what, what do you want me to understand from this? And, and in good association, talk it through and to get some insight from, you know, other genuine well-wishing devotees. I found that to be the single most important factor that makes a difference. Because what I've also seen in my life is if I get the message, if I actually, okay, I get the message, you want me to do this or you want me to change in this way. I found that if I do that, then things really just automatically improve. And so the lesson could be from being tolerant. It could be being compassionate. It could be, as Marge said, you know, trying to, you know, transform, you know, negativity into positivity by sweet words. I remember once, I was running late for a meeting. And so, you know, I was delayed, but I, I went from my home to where, you know, where you get the bus to get to the train station. And I was running, the bus was about to go, but luckily I was able to get on onto the bus, onto the vehicle on time. And I paid my fare and the driver, they said something negative. I didn't quite hear what they said. They said it was just something negative and I, I walked past and I thought, you know, I was getting a, lot, a little noise. I came back and said, so what did, you, what did you say? And then they were even more negative and everyone else on the bus was watching this whole thing go out. And what was funny is um, at the ISKCON London Temple, soon before this incident, I had given a seminar on forgiveness. So I, kind of, I felt, okay, you, you have to practice you preach. I went to the bus driver. I said, I'm sorry if, if I've upset you. And what was interesting is the bus driver then apologized to me and then they started to explain their circumstances. So they were, there was a concern about their job. They were fearful of losing their job. If I remember correctly, I think a relative had some illness and also the way the buses are, if they come to different points on the journey at the wrong time, then their managers you know, criticize them, all of this stuff. So their behavior towards me, it was not really to, about me. It was about all the other circumstances in their life that they were struggling with, which were, they were unable to process and deal with. So there's also the fact that sometimes the people who are, who are negative to us, if you knew the full story about what they're going through, and, and it, may not be, it may not be obvious, sometimes, it, it, I've seen this a lot with devotees, sometimes externally the life looks one way, but internally it's completely a different story. You know, so what I'm trying to say is it's often important not to take things on face value. That's one point. Second, to understand the people who are trying to hurt us are the same people who are hurt in some way. Because people who are joyful and happy, they don't go around deliberately trying to put people down. It's not a symptom of a, of a contempt person. It's more the symptom of a person who's struggling in some way. And as we mentioned in the previous class it's then about and Marge just put this very nicely it's about compassion to them and compassion towards us so with the guidance of what's Krishna trying to teach me it may be as Marge said it may be maybe keep a distance it may be Krishna wants to move me into a different service but that prayerful mood the mood of compassion towards themselves and ourselves you know when devotees try to be there was a statement by Prabhupada he said do not try to be more of a Paramahamsa than me which is an interesting statement. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's part of humility. It's like, okay, what's your actual capacity? 
if this is going to get you to the point where you're going to become offensive, it means you shouldn't be interacting in this way. So you want to maintain your Krishna consciousness. You want to maintain that sense of communal you know, well-being without necessarily being brought down by other people. And, and again, as, a, as is the principle, sometimes if we're very close to a situation, we need some perspective from someone who's not so directly emotionally involved. And they can give us another perspective and, and then, okay, we're clear. This is what's going on. This is what's happening. I understand they're in pain or I understand that there's something going wrong in their life, which is causing them to act this way. But I also understand that now it's causing some you know, disturbance to me and I don't want to become offensive. I want to protect my spiritual life. And I don't also want to encourage offensive behavior in other people. So I may, if that's the conclusion, if that's what, I, what we feel is best, I may kind of interact or step away. The one thing I'll add is that if, if there's the lesson that Krishna wants us to learn in a specific circumstance, then the lesson can come again if we haven't learned it. So sometimes it's also the case that there's an issue with one person, so we step away. We go somewhere else, there's the same issue with another person. And that can often be a sign, no, this is something that you need to work through. Because if you notice wherever you go, the same issue arises. So it's not everyone else, it's something within me, something within the way that I may be thinking, feeling, the way I may be responding, that, that I need to adjust or, or work on. So that's, that's one of the things. If it's an issue that we have to take responsibility for and change within ourselves, wherever you go, it will follow you until we actually address it. Thank you. Um, the next several questions are kind of continuing on this theme of self-development, self-improvement. And the next one is from Shilpa Mataji for you, Buddha Bhavana Prabhu. She said, you mentioned the point of what you receive is based on your qualification and being simple hearted. Please, can you expand on that? Yeah, it's basically how sincere we are to want to progress in spiritual life. So someone may have a lot to give, but then it's a question of our receptivity. So, so when I was listening to, um, I was just listening to Lord Chaitanya's travels this morning. And so it was pointed out that there were, Lord Chaitanya, when he, was a, when, when he was on his travels, it's not that everyone who met him exactly became, you know, just like a Mahabhagavat. It wasn't like that. Some people became Mahabhagavat. Some people became Bhagavat. Some people became pious. So there's that Yeyataman Prapadyante. So yes, he has his God. He can give anything. But there's also the receptivity, the openness of the individual. And that's the Supreme Lord directly. So that principle goes through. So we see the same thing with Prabhupada. It's not that everyone who, who met Prabhupada surrendered their lives to Krishna consciousness. It's not true. Right? There's many, you read Lila Amrita, many people who met him. Some people, they were favorable. Some people were unfavorable. Some people respected him. Some people surrendered. But, but we know that he's a pure devotee of the Lord. So it's not just how pure is, you know, is, is the devotee. It's like, yeah, that's one factor. Then there's my receptivity, right? How, how open I am for what this person has to give, you know? And this is something that the Adhikar always improves if we keep developing. If we keep hearing, chanting sincerely without offense, then, then we, we naturally will develop more and more of a desire to receive the gift that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his followers have to offer us. So that, that um, Kriti Bihir is simplicity of heart. I mean, there's, there's some other definitions, but it's that willingness and that openness. It's also respect for the Vaishnavas. It's, it's that mood of respect and open-heartedness and sincerity, and that causes us to receive everything. So there's also explained that Narada Muni is in the Bhagavatam first canto, when he's speaking about how he became the person he became because his, his mother was a maidservant but his mood was he was very gentle he had all these good qualities which are lifted and because of his good qualities he was blessed by the bhaktivedantas so those are some thoughts on that thank you so much <clears throat> Gurmaraj, would you like to say something on that as well uh i think that's to say anything else would be pretentious. It was perfect. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, yeah, it's the receptivity. The individual 
you know, there's the sun is out, but if you're in if you're in a dark room, you think there's no sun. Come to the light, and you can receive the light. <laughs> so that's basically what he Buddha Bhavana was saying. Prabhupada had so much to give, but how many could people could actually receive it? And many people, not only I would even say people, not only didn't receive it, but didn't like what Prabhupada gave, even disagreed with him. There were people who left the movement because they didn't like Prabhupada's explanation of the fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. There was one, at least one or more devotees who left the movement because they didn't like Prabhupada's statement about we didn't go to the moon. <laughs> so yeah, and there were others who just couldn't surrender to, to the standards that Prabhupada had given us. But Prabhupada, when he dealt with these people, he dealt with them in a very careful and kind way. He wasn't like trying to heavy them out, but he gave them a chance to, to, to understand and receive. But due to their own conditioning, or at the same time their conditioning didn't allow them to see that this person who is speaking to me is actually a pure representative of God. If I can just accept what he says, there would be no problem. But, but we're, not everybody was up to that understanding, or at least they they would they couldn't see, you know, the purity of Srila Prabhupada. Because Prabhupada, many times he came down to a very simple personal person. He was just explaining things in a very simple way. Sometimes they even say that Prabhupada explained things so so simply that we needed to go someplace else to get higher knowledge. But that, <clears throat> that was another <clears throat> misunderstanding of what Prabhupada gave us. Prabhupada talked according to time, place, and circumstance. He gave to his audience what his audience was about according to that particular time. How he responded to questions, how he responded to criticisms was always different in every different in different venues. One time <clears throat> Prabhupada was talking about you know, first class men, second class men, third class men, fourth class men. <clears throat> and this was in a student auditorium. I think it was in Australia, Melbourne. <clears throat> One student got up and said, uh, you know, well, actually you think you're first class. And, you know, it was immediately a criticism for Sheila Prabhupada actually stopped and uh, became silent. Tears came to his eyes and he said, actually, I'm fifth class. I'm just trying to serve the other four classes. <laughs> so that was how he dealt with that particular situation. He, he was in a mood of natural humility and then didn't, didn't want to, you know, stay in any other way. He just expressed his emotions in that way. And then other times when people would challenge him, he would say that he would get very strong with them. So uh, Prabhupada, therefore people could not understand Prabhupada because he was so different in so many different in so many different occasions. He was always right for the occasion. <laughs> That's why people have problems with Prabhupada now because Sometimes he said one thing, and sometimes he said the opposite thing. <laughs> but it was always according to time, place, and circumstance. And the scriptures are like that, too. <laughs> Those who are super intelligent, who know scriptures, can interpret scriptures in, in so many different ways, with different conclusions from the different interpretations. You can actually, you know, you can actually analyze Srimad Bhagavatam and come to the conclusion that it's all about impersonalism. <laughs> I've seen Banu Swami do that when he was explaining the third canto. He said, you yeah, know, there are devotees, there are people who can come by taking these verses and come to an impersonal conclusion. So the receptivity has to be there. And receptivity is is creates transparency and transparency allows you to understand not only the mood but the person who's giving it mm -hmm. 
can I just add one thing? Yeah. And that is, um, so there was the memories of Prabhupada and it was Harry Kesh. And I think it's Harry Kesh. And he, anyway, this pastime and these, um, to, to Marge's point, there were these, I think it was in India, there were these Brahm, I believe there were Brahmins and they came to visit Prabhupada and they were criticizing him directly, saying that you're ruining the invader, you're ruining Vedic culture. You know, you're giving all these militias and yavanas initiation, you're completely destroying our Vedic culture. And what happened was, it was, and so I think it was Harry K, she said it was amazing, the past time, because Prabhupada was sitting down and they came into the room and they just started blasting him and criticizing and criticizing him. Prabhupada, he just, he just stayed seated and just took a very humble position. And, and it was, and what happened was, it was, what was so amazing about it is that they were talking about how he's ruining Vedic culture, but the contrast was so there. He was just in a very, very humble mood and they were shouting, being rude, angry, and so on. So you, it, and it, was, it actually was occurring to them in real time that we're criticizing him for destroying Vedic culture. He's just taking this very humble, saintly position and we're shouting, being angry, and so on. So the, the contrast actually became apparent to them and they just turned around and left. You know, so to, um, to Chan Mahaj's point, Prabhupada, that connection with Krishna, he just spontaneously would react in, in just like in the same key example, but just in whatever situation needed, it would just spontaneously be in that, in that mood. It was yeah, just incredible to see. <clears throat> the next question is for both of you as well. And it's related to relationships. Um, this is Janaki Prabhu asking on behalf of another devotee. He says, we understand that having key, deep, and meaningful relationships is the key success to spiritual life. For this, Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu mentioned that we need time, energy, and headspace to invest in relationships. But if we lack in these three things, it is difficult to develop deep relationships. Any practical tips on how to develop these deep relationships? Sometimes the relationships we have seem very superficial. For this reason, a lot of devotees are feeling very lonely due to superficial relationships, and hence their practice is also superficial and tasteless. Well, the way to actually develop a relationship is take a personal concern in the interest of the other person. See what they they may need in life or what you can give them in their life to, to help them, to improve them, to make them happy. And that's a way to, not, it's not a technique, it's actually, the, that's the basis of how relationships develop, concern for the other person. If you try to enter into a relationship from what you can get out of it, then you'll find that you won't really develop a, a deep relationship. It'll be on the superficial level. Both will be trying to get from whatever they can get from the other person to the relationship. But if you're concerned about the other person and you want to develop a deep relationship, then try to see what they need. If you can fulfill that need, whether it's something about health, something about about what they're struggling with on the on the spiritual platform or on the mental platform, something. How can I serve this person? And that that opens up the relationship, the mood of service. That's the basic principle of relationship. Because there's an old saying, love means to serve. And serve means to serve in a way that is beneficial to the object of your service. So how can I serve you? In a genuine way, not in just a, a euphemistic way. How can I serve you? It sounds very nice. But no, how can I serve you? What can I do? And you may not have to ask that, but you can, by observing the person, you can maybe see how you can make a difference in that person's life. And your happiness depends on the happiness you can give others. When you give others happiness, you become happy. That's the principle of bhakti, actually. 
So wanting to make another person happy is the greatest happiness that we can achieve. And that, that deepens a relationship because there's nothing, it's not, there's nothing exploitive about that mood. What can I do for you? In a genuine sense, not in just a, you know, a statement of, you know, nicety <laughs> in the genuine sense. And see how receptive that, that person is. If that person is not receptive, then you can see if you can, if you can serve in another way. But, to, but generally, if you're concerned about another person, you're trying to help, people appreciate that in one way or the other. They can tell the difference whether you're coming to them to give something or you're coming to them to take something. It has to be about giving, otherwise the relationship won't really develop. If it does, it becomes just, becomes like business. And that also is true in, in maritable relationships too. It's true in every relationship. The mood of service to the, to the other person. I don't know too much, but that's as much as I can say on that one. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Prabhu, would you like to say something? Yeah, I just want to say Maharaj's response was brilliant. So it's, it's, I just want to really echo just the same point that Maharaj made. It's, it's about service. And I think that that's why often we struggle with relationships, because we, we work from the basis that I want to come and get something. And then I'm approaching someone. I want you to give me something. So I'm coming to you. I want your job is to give me what I want. And it's, it doesn't work. It really doesn't work. If I, if I start with the mood of service, so I'm coming to serve, then definitely it just changes. And it changes not just in terms of what the person sees, but it's subtle. You know, I, I was thinking back to this point, yeyatamam prapadyante. That's an eternal principle. If you if you care about Krishna, then also that reciprocation is there. If you don't care, he becomes neutral. He doesn't become negative, but he becomes neutral because okay, you you don't have any desire to want to know me. You're just coming to try to exploit, and it's it's a natural psychology that we all have. So if we have that mood, let me first see what I can actually give. So you find someone that you maybe as Marge was saying before the one that you think you can get along with, you know, there's some mutual interest and understanding as Prabhupada says in third canto Bhagavatam, and you're coming with an orientation of giving. I had a mentee and he had, he had this concern about relationships. And as we looked into it, he was going to people and he, and what he wanted them to do is that he wanted them to come with him to do his service at the time that works for him. And so we had, what he pointed out is that, yeah, but you, the whole thing is centered around what you want. And he wasn't, he wasn't conscious of it. But it's like, yeah, I want you to come and help me with my service at this time. We, I want us to do this. So this is what I'm interested in. This is the time that I'm available and I want you to fit into my, my desire. And, and, no one resp and there was no response because without meaning to, it was all centered around whatever I want. And that's, that doesn't work. The Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam, as we go deep, they all have these universal principles and that yeyatamam prapajante, that's the law of relationships. If you care about the other person and they're decent, then there'll be reciprocation. If you don't care and you just want to take, no one wants to be exploited. So, yeah. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. So we're already almost at time. So we'll ask one last question before we close today. And this is also for both of you. How is it possible for people who are not Brahmins, who are not, who are, sorry, how is it possible for people who are not Brahmins, who are situated in the modes of passion and ignorance, to elevate to goodness? What is the difference between dovetailing the modes of passion and ignorance to Krishna's service versus elevating ourselves to the mode of goodness? Well, 
Kota, Baba, you want to take that one? <laughs> I'll, I'll follow your lead, Maharaj. <laughs> it sounds like a complex question. If you ask me to lead, I'll do it. But my preference is for you to go first. <laughs> I'm your servant, so if, you, if your preference is me to go first, I have to go first. Okay. I'll, go, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go first, only if you want to go first. <laughs> I'll go first if it pleases you. It does, because I know I know you have the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So since I've been asked to go first, it, it, it's not so much about the varna. It's not about whether we're, as Marge said, we're devotees, we're servants of Krishna, we're the servant of the servant of Krishna. So that's, that's point number one. And that's really important to understand. Point number two, it doesn't matter what kind of nature we have, in Kali Yuga, there's so much influence of the lower modes. So don't think that you're in a, you're in a different space to everyone else. We're all in that same situation as a starting point. So first of all, we're, we're spirit souls. Second point, we're all in this situation in the world as it is with so much mode of ignorance and mode of passion, etc. So the solution is the same for us all. The solution is that we practice Krishna consciousness in the association of devotees, regularly practicing our hearing, our chanting in the association, and through that sincere practice, all of us, no matter what situation we've come from, no matter what our starting point, will all be elevated through whatever mode we're starting in, through to the mode of goodness and beyond the mode of goodness to the transcendental platform. So it's not it's not whether we're Brahmanas or not, whether we're, it, there's, there's no, none of these things because in Kali Yuga I can't remember which there's a Shastra which says that in Kali Yuga um, like demons will take birth in Brahmana families to cause some kind of I can't remember the exact words but to cause some kind of havoc or you know negativity so don't worry about the nature at all where our nature is spirit soul and the thing that will the process that will elevate all of us is hearing chanting and being in the, and reading in the association of devotees, especially of devotees who are more advanced than us. And by the blessings and purification, we will all come up to a higher platform and ultimately achieve perfection. I, I completely adhere to what, to what you say, but I would like to add just one point. Because as we pr practice Krishna consciousness, we, we go forward. But I would say we should also learn what are the qualities of the mode of goodness and try along with our practice of Krishna consciousness, as mentioned by Bhuta Bhavana Prabhu, to cultivate these moods, these different qualities in the mode of goodness simultaneously, along with our practice of Krishna consciousness. I think that accelerates the, the, the process more when there's a conscious uh, 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 cultivation of the qualities of the mode of goodness and at the same time, or maybe say foremost, hearing, chanting, associating with devotees. Um, I, like to, I like to combine both of those principles together. Because we might be hearing, chanting, and practicing Krishna consciousness, but we might still be cultivating the modes of compassion and ignorance simultaneously. <laughs> so that could be a, a problem. <laughs> Not ignorance, but the mode of passion. Because as Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu mentioned in his lecture, the mode of passion looks good at the beginning. So sometimes we're stimulated by that. But then we don't realize that in the long run, it'll take away from our uh, the, the cultivation of the, our, our good qualities. So I would combine both of those together in one package. <laughs> Thank you both very much. Um, so this concludes our Stagosti. Thank you so much for such wonderful questions that were submitted. So sorry that we didn't get to all of them. And of course, thank you so much, Gurmaraj and Bhutabhavana Prabhu for the wonderful 
thorough answer has given us a lot to think about. Um, so to close us off and to introduce the last part of the program, I just wanted to throw it to Shilpa Mataji, who is the brains behind the organization of this entire retreat. And I know she won't say it at the end, so I'll say it now. Um, she's the one who spent lots of time just organizing all of the logistics. It might look a little smooth to you all, but it's because Shilpa Mataji had her hand in all of the details, organizing the team, organizing the technology, organizing the, the methodology of doing the questions and the answers, organizing the kirtan. She's done, she just put the whole team into gear. So thank you so much, Shilpa Mataji, and over to you to introduce the next part of the program. Haribo. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Um, there was no need for that, rather Bhakti Mataji, but anyway, you pulled a fast one me, as always. <laughs> so um, I just wanted, before we go on to uh, the next part of our program, by all means, this is not finished. We still have Kirtan uh, for half an hour. Uh, lovingly, Panchatattva is kindly going to for us to finish off. But just before we go there, um, I just wanted um, to touch base on something really special. Um, as always, um, Guru Maharaj always instructs us to do a disciples meeting and we truly appreciate that. And yesterday, Buddha Bhavana Prabhu, you said something quite pertinent to this and you mentioned that um, it was about glorifications. And you mentioned that um, we need to glorify devotees because in order to glorify, it transforms them as well. And I know Guru Maharaj doesn't always like us to glorify him, but I think you made such an important point that sometimes we do need to glorify. So- You don't have to do it now though. You can do it later. Marge, we thought we'd do it now and then we'll go to Kirtan and then we'll finish. It's going to be quick, Guru Marge. Okay, five words limit. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, that's it. Last that's enough. <laughs> we put the Bhavana Prabhu, we never get a look in, but today we will try. Yeah. Bhutta Bhavana requires the appreciation because most of us, we don't see or hear from him throughout the year. So I would personally like to thank him. And I'm always inspired for him, his insight into the dynamics of the practice of Krishna consciousness, which are really unique and revolutionary and right on according to Srila Prabhupada's principles and teachings. So uh, I'm honored to be in the association of such a personality who has a deep understanding of the practice of Krishna consciousness and is exemplary in his own practice. So again, thank you, Bhutta Bhava Prabhu, for being with us. No, Mar Mar and this is the highlight. This is the highlight for me for this program <laughs> is to have have you here. I want to say that in the in the past, even before the passing away, the physical departure of my spiritual master, I can only see say that Chandamuli Maharaj has been one of the the greatest blessings in my life. His association, his enthusiasm, his insight, and um, his continual encouragement. And his example also, and, 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 and also his own purity, Marge's own purity, his own deep realization, and Marge's own example of being a genuine sadhu has been a, like a, a tremendous blessing. And, and I personally feel it's made, it's, made a it's made significant differences to my life, not just in, by his very presence and also by the instructions and the guidance and the insight that he shed and the classes. So I'm, I feel, you know, protected, blessed, and also saved by, by such association. So from my side, I mean, we're, we're always indebted, like really indebted to Maharaj. And we're just very, very fortunate that even though this is a, he's an exalted Vaishnav, a very great devotee of the Lord, but he still kindly 
offers us an opportunity to do some service and to also receive his association. So um, I'd love to hear more glorification of Chandra William Maharaj myself. Thank you, Buddha Bhavana. <laughs> Thank you, Buddha Bhavana. So let's start. Uh, first of all, we'd like to glorify the hosting team. All this IT work is hard. And we'll start quickly. Thank you to Anjali Mataji behind the scenes. Uh, Sridhari Mataji, Runda Mataji, uh, Vivek Prabhu, Lavanya Mataji, and Arshna Siddhi Mataji. Without you, this retreat would have not run as smoothly as it has. I think a lot of devotees would agree. So, Hare Krishna. Next, our presenters, we have Radha Bhakti and Lavanya Mataji, and also, especially, we have Ananta Prabhu and Brahma Murthy. Now, they, without hesitation, and they have their own reasons, like Buddha Bhavana does, and they jumped at the chance to present for us. So we are indebted to them. Don't forget Chandra. Oh, no, I'm coming to that, Guru Maharaj. Okay. <laughs> so thank you for always being part of our God family. And actually, I consider you our God family as well. Um, next. We have the IT team. Thank you for your presentation. Please, devotees, help with this IT project. They've got great plans. And I think if we truly, like Buddha Bhavana said again, if we truly serve together, then we can please our Guru Maharaj and Sri Prabhupada. And I think that is the whole purpose of serving. So please reach out to them. Next, we have Radha Vinodini Mataji. She is a gem. As soon as the lectures went out, she instantly put them on YouTube. <laughs> so they're updated and available all. So thank you, Radha Mataji. Next, we have um, Panchatattva. Panchatattva Temple, always for us, uh, led by Her Grace Shamadati. I mean, they have been wonderful. They don't need asking. They're willing to serve. And they were there in a heartbeat. You actually have put a perfect ending to our retreat this weekend. So thank you, Banchatattva. Next, we come on to Chandra Prabhu. Um, where can I start? Guru Maharaj told me on Friday, can you reach out to Chandra Prabhu? And I said to uh, Bumaj, I will try, I'm not sure, but Chandra Prabhu, you have been uh, a beacon, thank you. It was almost like um, quick emails between you and I, but I think you've actually made um, this retreat an icing on the cake, so thank you for being here for us. And I think you also have your personal reasons, like Buddha Bhavana does while you're here. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, I have to go to Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu. Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu, what can I say? When the name Disciples Retreat comes up, your name always comes up first. Um, ever since I've been attending the Disciples meeting, it's almost it's almost like you'll be there. And your message is just transformational. It just makes us think of why we're really here. Um, and what is our purpose? We carry on about serving, um, doing our service, but I think you always bring it home. You always get to the essence of serving. And another beautiful you think you say is about serving Guru. You touch a lot of base on this about our mood and the importance of having a Guru and serving by your own experience. So thank you for reminding us, Guru Bhavana Prabhu, you are truly a member of this God family. Actually, we can say you are our God brother. We will adopt you, Guru Bhavana Prabhu. <laughs> um, 
Next, uh, Jankinat Prabhu. Uh, usually, Jankinat Prabhu is also a beacon at our disciples' meeting. Um, unfortunately, he has lost his voice, and so he tells us. I think it was just a get out clause, Jankinat Prabhu. But we'd like to see you online if you're there. Oh. Jankina Prabhu, thank you. You're always there for us. And I think you don't need to say anything, but just your presence and communicating with you always gives us a strength when we're, um, yeah, when we're serving, because I think you are an example to how we should serve. And I've known you for quite a while, Jankina Prabhu, so I can say that wholeheartedly. <laughs> Okay, next we'll come to um, Guru Maharaj. It's going to be quick, Guru Maharaj. I know you don't like glorification. So, um, Buddha Bhavana Prabhu, again and again, you mentioned the importance of how we underestimate our Guru. Sometimes we, we get the blessings and we don't always understand it. We don't always understand how fortunate we are when we have a guru right in front of us. Um, I think sometimes we don't appreciate the love. We are too busy in our lifestyles. And I think, um, I think the importance of having a guru and a guru that is always there for us unconditionally. I think that's the main one. Um, a guru that serves us and serves us with love and always approaches us when we don't approach him. So Guru Maharaj, thank you for being there. Sometimes we do not deserve your love, but I think I speak for a lot of disciples wholeheartedly that we do appreciate you in our life. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Um, I will leave it there. And we had a testimonial that came in and it was for you, Guru Maharaj, and I'll just read it. It said, thank you, Guru Maharaj. Um, this is just what we needed at a time like this. So thank you for making up to your disciples and serving us. Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada's desire to make the world Krishna consciousness is so strong and so intense and so constant that anyone who comes in contact with Srila Prabhupada has to feel something of that desire. So it's by his intensity of desire to reach every living entity. And of course, he's simply simply reflecting Lord Chaitanya's mood in this age. Lord Chaitanya wants every living entity to come to the platform of worshiping and serving the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Srila Prabhupada is intense. His mood of compassion is coupled with his intense desire to give that compassion to everyone at every minute of his life when he was here and now he's working he's trying to work through us to do the same thing he's still very much alive in this movement he's still the main factor of how everything goes on and as long as we stay connected to Srila Prabhupada we look like we're doing something but it's actually him that's behind the scenes pushing us and inspiring in us correcting us guiding us and continually uh, urging us to uh, reach out to as many people as we can with Lord Chaitanya's message of compassion. We owe everything ultimately to his divine grace. Without him, there is actually nothing, zero. We are simply zero. <laughs> Thank you very much. And lastly, can we thank all the 
family that have joined online to participate. Without you, this event wouldn't have been as successful as it is. Please turn your cameras on, God family, if you can. And hopefully next year we will meet in person. Um, I think we're all dying to meet again in person. So hopefully, I think Bema Murthy mentioned this on a chat, um, that next year we'll be together and we'll celebrate together somewhere. So Krishna Willie. So Guru Maharaj, if you have any final words or Buddha Bhavana, if you have any final words, please share or we can move on to Kirtan for half an hour to end our session. Hare Krishna. Sri Harinam Sankirtan Ki Jai. Jai. Mr. Bhavana Prabhu, you have been muted. Would you like to say something or? No, I shall. I was just going to. I should try. Okay. So uh, we'll move on and we'll have some kirtan and we'll finish off the program after kirtan. So, Pancha Tattva, Shamadachi Mataji, are you there? They're going. Turn on the sound. Marco, Kirpan. So me that. Marco, boy.
ますありがとうございます。